<clears throat> so Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then, on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. And looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4, I solemnly urge you, solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires, and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at living, work at telling others the good news and fully carrying out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to this appearing. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Help us to live in the light of those words. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in both of these scriptures, Paul is painting a picture of his life. He's given himself completely to spreading the gospel. And he's encouraging the believers. And now, because of the events God has chosen for him, his life is near its end. He, in the first one that I read from uh, Philippians, I just wanted to look at, um, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring out it out like a liquid offering to God. And then in the second one, he says... As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. His life is near its end. In both of these, we see that Paul is giving instructions to believers. One, he's writing to the church at Philippi and encouraging them to continue in the faith. It doesn't seem like he thinks he'll see them again in this life, but he's looking forward to the day they will meet with Jesus. And all of the struggles of his ministry and their faithfulness will be rewarded. In the second letter, this is the letter to Timothy. Second letter to Timothy, as a matter of fact. This is now Timothy, a grown man, a faithful disciple of Paul. And it paints an interesting picture of being poured out. Now, to Paul and every Jewish person reading this, pouring out to them had a real symbolic significance. It was something they did. This is something God had established Way back, even before the law of Moses, the first recorded pouring out offering actually happens in Genesis chapter 35. Jacob set up a stone pillar. This is verse, uh, verse 14, Jake, Genesis 35, 14. Jacob set up a stone pillar to mark the place where God had spoken to him. Then he poured the wine over it as an offering to God and anointed the pillar with olive oil. And Jacob named the place Bethel, which means house of God, because God had spoken to him there. And this has a real significance in the history of Israel. Um, you can go back, believe it or not, Abraham is the first one to meet God in that place. Abraham is the first one who, it was near Bethel, God spoke to him and gave him promises. 
And it made a significance in his life. And then Jacob, for him, the significant was he's running away from home. His brother Esau wants to kill him. He's stolen the birthright. And his parents are like, you know what? I think you really need to go away and go to your uncle Laban because your brother's going to kill you. I think his mother is the one that kind of told him that. So he's fleeing and he's traveling. He's just got clothes on his back. And he lies down for the night in this place in the wilderness. And it says a stone was his pillow. And he dreams. And in the dream, there's a staircase. And there are angels going up and down, bringing things down from heaven and messages back to God. And he wakes up and he's like, I didn't realize this was the place of God. This is Bethel. Same place that his grandfather met with God. And so now... This, what we just read from, though, is much later in his life. He's now, he's got a big family. He has flocks and herds. He's met up with Esau. And they made peace. Esau didn't kill him. And unfortunately, his family has gotten involved in things they shouldn't. They're not following God. And this is finally a point where they're like, you know what? He's like, we need to go back to Bethel. And I think God tells him, go back to Bethel and offer a sacrifice again. And this is when God changes his name from Jacob, which means deceiver, to Israel, which means one who wrestles with God, or one who wrestled and prevailed. And Jacob is back here, and he has a, another, when God appeared to him, I believe it's in a dream, and said, you're no longer Jacob, you're no longer the deceiver. You are now the one who has found favor with me and I'm giving you a new name and so this is the first time a poured out offering the oil and the wine it, it's Jacob kind of symbolizing I'm giving myself I'm pouring myself out to God now we see in the law of Moses part of making a burnt offering was pouring out something in the offering Exodus 29 verse 38 these are the sacrifices you are to offer regularly on the altar each day offer two lambs that are a year old, one in the morning and the other in the evening. With one of them offer two quarts of choice flour mixed with one quart of pure, olive pressed, pure oil of pressed olives. Also offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Offer the lamb in the evening along with the same offerings of flour and wine as in the morning. It will be a pleasing aroma, a special gift presented to the Lord. These burnt offerings are to be made each day from generation to generation. Offer them in the Lord's presence at the tabernacle entrance. There I will meet with you and speak with you. I will meet the people of Israel there in a place made holy by my glorious presence. Yes, I will consecrate the tabernacle and the altar, and I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will live among the people of Israel and be their God. God was looking for this continuous, everyday sacrifice to be made in the morning and in the evening. And part of that was this pouring of the wine and the oil. Some sources I read said it was poured on the sacrifice. Some said they were poured next to the altar. I, I don't know if there's a significance to that necessarily. But these sacrifices were offered every day, morning and evening, as long as the tabernacle and later on the temple stood and the worship of God continued. When God set up this system of worship in the tabernacle, he gave two main categories for the people to give to worship. Now, there's two main categories, and one of these is tithes. One of these is 10% of what you have gained. Now, that's an easy thing to figure. If God gave, you have 10 of something, you give one to him. If you have 100, you give him 10. It, it, it's easy to figure. And this is for whatever you have gained, no matter what it is that you do. For a businessman, 10% is 10% of your money. That's the way most of us live today. For a farmer, it was 10% of the animals born to him. Or the eggs he harvested. 
or the wool that he sheared, or the meat that was processed, or the fruit or grain that was brought into storage, or pressed into oil, or wine, or whatever it was. It was all of these things, and you brought 10%. And the tithe was what you brought to the priests. This was what they lived on. This is what provided for them and for their families. It's what provided for their robes and repairs to the tabernacle or things for the temple. The work that went on, that's what tithes are for. That 10% was to take care of those who serve God. And God considered this important. This 10% was his. And if you didn't give it to him, he saw you as a thief. You had stolen that 10% from him if you did not give it. And that's the way that God looked at this. And he set this down and said, this is important for you to do. He also saw if you gave him something that wasn't the best of what you had harvested, you were supposed to bring a little bit of the first of your harvest. The, the first lamb maybe to be born or the first um, of the fruit that you harvested or the first of the oil that you pressed or, or whatever it was. You were to bring a little bit of the first, but you were to bring him the best is what he said. And he knew, because he knows everything, he knew if you, you know, those are the best apples I have over there. I really don't want to bring those to God. Let's just take some of the rest. And we'll keep the best for ourselves. God knew that. And he said, you stole from me. I said to bring of the best. Bring of the best that you have. The best that I've given you. Now, in the New Testament, getting on, still following in this idea of a tithe, we don't see anywhere that says, you have to give me 10%. Nowhere in the Bible that says that, in the New Testament. The Old Testament, God says, you're stealing from me if you don't. What we do see is instead 2 Corinthians 9. I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. For I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. But I am sending these brothers to be sure that you are ready, as I have been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found out that you weren't ready after all. I had told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promise is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift not one given grudgingly. Remembering this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will give generously provided all you, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take our gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. So the old system that I talked about, the Old Testament, had a fixed amount that you had to give God that. Or you were stealing from him. But this has been replaced with one that is an offering, really. That's what Paul says. And, and Paul is laying down the way the church is to live. Jesus didn't say anything differently. You're to give cheerfully out of love of God 
and each other. So that the praise goes to God, not to you. It's still a good idea, I think, to make sure that 10% of your income is given to the place that you get your soul fed. These lights don't light themselves. The water doesn't come in here just all by itself. Bills have to be paid. The building has to be maintained. Many churches, their pastor depends on that salary to live. It's not that he's getting rich, but he needs that to live. Um, and so that's why it's a good idea to give that 10%. It's not set down, though, that if you don't give 10%, you're stealing from God. But God is looking at your heart. He's looking at what you want to do. Remember what Paul just said to these believers. You want to give. You're an encouragement when you do, and it's a pleasing thing for God. But you shouldn't stop there if you love God and are thankful. It shouldn't just be what you put in the offering plate or however you give to your church. And some churches you can do it with PayPal or on your phone now. <laughs> but however you do it, what you want to be doing is, as Paul said, the more you plant, the more you will see a harvest. This means spread what God has given you in not just money, but in time, resources, in love. The love that you can give people, the resources, the time. In, many, in as many ways as you find an opportunity. You know, give to missions, give to the poor. Don't give it to get noticed and applauded, as Jesus said. Don't let one hand know what the other hand's doing. If you did it, so everybody goes, oh, yeah, you're a good person. We'll put your name on a plaque and we'll have a ceremony and we'll give you the plaque. It doesn't matter to God. You just got your reward when they gave you that plaque. As useless as that piece of wood with a little sign on it is, that's your reward for everything you did. What you're supposed to be looking at is, I'm giving this to God. It could be your time. Maybe you don't have money. You can still give your time to God. That's what he's looking for. You can share what you have. God keeps track of it all. He's looking to give you a greater harvest than you ever gave him. In the Old Testament, getting back to what we were looking at before, you had your tithes. So boom, there's one category. You gave God 10%, and if you didn't, he said, you're stealing from me. And you gave him the best 10%. The next thing is offerings. Offerings were above your tithe. They were not required. There was nowhere that said, if you don't give me offerings... I will be angry with you and take things away from you the way that he said if you steal your tithes from me. But they were required if you wanted a right standing with God. Many of them were. The sin offerings were required. If you didn't give these, it wasn't that you weren't a thief in God's eyes. It is that you were not right in his eyes. The, the sin offering that you made and, and these burnt offerings where everything went to God. Atonement is part of, but not its sole purpose, which was for the complete dedication of sins. It was the, the way you gave for sealing the, the commitment that you had to God for the covenant to be made between you and God to be right. These, this symbolizes the way our past sins are purged out in Jesus' atonement. These were not shared with anyone. They were entirely devoted to God and were burned. Purification offerings. Sin steals life from God. This was viewed as giving life back to God as a replacement. And much like the way... Now, these were shared with the priests. And... Much like the way we share our victories with each other as God gives them. And this is speaking of our continual sacrificing of ourselves to God as he purifies us. And then, believe it or not, there's another one that's mentioned as a, a, an offering. And I had never really seen this before until I was looking at this. But making restitution for lying or stealing or cheating is seen as an offering to God. It's seen as something you're giving to him. It 
isn't given to God. It was given to the one you wronged, the one you lied to, the one you cheated, the one that you stole from. You were to go back and make restitution, and quite often that restitution was for much more than you actually took originally. But God sees that as an offering because you're, you're making it right and giving yourself. I can tell you I had to go back and make restitutions, and it was hard, but God blessed me by doing them. Um, and so that is another offering we give to God. The final category of offerings are the ones given out of gratitude and love. If you love God, you will want to give these. <clears throat> these aren't just your money. They're your time, your, your love, your life, your everything, as we've mentioned before. God gave Israel the instructions for some of these to actually bring them to the tabernacle and eat them in the presence of the Lord. They'd eat a, a feast there in the tabernacle or later on the temple. And it was something that as they ate it, they were to be giving praise to God for blessing them. And they would share this with priests, and quite often they'd share this with other people as well. And it was a, look what God has given me that is good, and I am eating this as a, in thankfulness to him. If God had given you blessings, you weren't just to bring that to the tabernacle or the temple, though. You were to share it with those around you, especially the poor, the widow, the orphan, the ones who couldn't take care of themselves, that had to beg. And God saw all of these offerings, and he was pleased with them. Now, when we look at how does that work for the Christian, we know that Jesus was the completion of the burnt offering for sin and the completion of the morning and evening sacrifice. It's even something we've looked at the arrest and the crucifixion of Jesus and we think of the morning and evening sacrifice. What's the significance? And if you look at the timeline of the day Jesus was crucified, he was hung on the cross at the time of the morning sacrifice. And he made the ultimate end and said, it is finished at the time of the evening sacrifice. So he was the offering. And his blood was poured out. So we have the idea of a poured out sacrifice, a poured out offering, a completion. And Jesus said, it is finished. And that old, old system passed away and we are under the new one. So a young lamb was being offered on the altar in the temple at the moment Jesus said, it is finished. And at the moment he was hung on the cross. When he was saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And you think of that prayer. That's something that's poured out of Jesus along with his blood. And at the same time, those lambs were being sacrificed. The priest was there pouring the oil and the wine as part of that sacrifice. And meanwhile, the Lamb of God was pouring out his blood and his life on the cross for our sins. And that sacrifice is complete. Jesus' blood poured out once forever is what we understand washes away our sin and it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We still need to make... So those are taken care of. The first two that I mentioned. But this, the restitution for cheating, for stealing, for lying. Those are offerings we need to still continue to make. Those are things that we give to God and going back and making them right. And he counts that. Since we are under the new covenant in Jesus, and that's the covenant he purchased by offering himself as a sacrifice for God, pouring out his own blood, we remember that. We do communion. We take the bread, his body broken for you. We take the grape juice, his blood poured out for you, is really the, the literal meaning the sacrifice that's there, the, the flour and the oil that would have made the unleavened bread that Jesus was breaking there is, was seen in the sacrifice. And, and that's what we remember when we take those. Everything we are and have and can do and can be is to be an offering given to God if we share in that remembrance of his sacrifice for us. Jesus died so that we can live for God. 
If we are living for God, we are not going to be focused on what we can gain in this world. The correct attitude is that everything we have is God's already. This, this, you know, I, I've heard the illustration, it, it's the way you hold on to it. Do you hold on to it like this or like this so you can let it go easily? If God calls you to, let me have that. Give that to me. We should be that way. Okay, Lord, it's yours. I give it to you. And the way that we treat the things we have, and like mine, but what can I do for others? How can I give? And there are perfect I mean, some people are called to go to be missionaries in other countries, and they leave everything behind. Family, friends, a career, all the dreams that they had. There are others who live for God here. And the way they live for God is in giving themselves to God and giving themselves to others, serving. The correct attitude is that everything we have is God's already. And Jesus taught us we're not to be building up treasures in this world. We're to be putting our treasures in heaven. Now these treasures in heaven are what we give to God through helping others, through giving to others, through giving to God's work. And not just giving out of our great wealth, but giving even if it hurts, to the point that it hurts. To the Jesus, he had the time where he's in the temple and he's watching at the treasury and there are people coming in and they have bags full of money and they're pouring them in. And this, a, a woman who comes there and Jesus recognizes that she's a widow. She puts two pennies in. Now, a penny back then was a day's wage. That was a lot of money. And for her to be a widow and to put in two days' worth of food, two days' worth of what she needed to live, Jesus said she gave everything. The amounts the, men, the ones with the bags full of money put in didn't hurt them. What she gave was all. And this is what Paul is talking about. He'd given his whole life. He'd given himself completely to God. And he knew that he was soon going to have his blood spilled out for his faith. And he saw this as his final offering to give God. Just like the lambs that Paul himself, as a Pharisee, as a good Jewish person, had brought to the temple. And he would have brought wine, he would have brought oil, and he would have offered that to God. It would have been poured out for God. Now he's looking at it, his own body, his blood, would be poured out for God. He had lived that way since he met Jesus. That's what he told the Philippians. And he was ready to die the same way. As a poured out offering. A poured out for God. If we really love God, we will give ourselves that same way. As an offering. Poured out to God. The way Jesus was for us. And as we talked about, it's not that you know, God is looking at you, you have to do it or you're stealing from me. It's that, Lord, I want to give you this. I love you. I give you this out of my love. I give myself. I give completely. That's why we surrender ourselves when we repent. That's why we surrender ourselves. As Paul said, I die daily. I give myself every day to God, to his will. And for Paul, if you have studied what he's gone through, he talks about being shipwrecked more times than we read about in the, the actual words of the scriptures. He talks about being a day and a night swimming in the ocean. Now, I don't find that in the gospel stories that we have of him traveling in the New Testament. But he says that's what it was. He said, I've been stoned to death a few times. I've been left for dead. I've had cold and hardship and hunger and slept outside. All of these things that I did for God. And he's like, but now I'm about to make the final sacrifice. All of that was given to God, but there's more. And whatever God calls us, whatever he wants for us, that's the sacrifice we're to make. Poured out for him. Jesus poured everything out for you. He poured everything out as the sacrifice. And we all owe all of that to him. The thing is, it's not about, well, I have to do it, so I will. It's, Lord, I want to give you this. It's the attitude of our heart that God is looking for. And that's the way to build up treasure. It's to be poured out as an offering. Everything that we have.